What is up, everybody, and welcome back to the Hush Life Podcast. This is episode 34. Today, we sit down with Brian, Casey, Logan, and Matt coming at you live from our very first elk hunt of this season, 2022. Stick around. We talk about a lot of good things. We talk about our season to come and how we will be unveiling our videos to all of you. So thank you for watching and enjoy the Hush Life Podcast. Take a gander. <laughs> Take a gander. That's amazing. <laughs> Casey and Brian's like, who are you? <laughs> okay, so we are recording. It's live. I'm going to bring in the music, and then Brian, introduce us. That's just such a great photo. <sighs> Probably going to be a t-shirt. <laughs> All the Matt eyes. I thought we had like an actual intro. No, I like that one. We usually do we a do, voice we one. Do a, we'll do a voice one. Yeah, Matt does a great intro. Does Matt have a good intro Se- voice? Second favorite cameraman. Yeah, go. Give us your best intro. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Matty Ice, your second favorite cameraman, and welcome back. To Whoa. another Hush Life podcast. <laughs> That's it. That was it. See, and then he put some good music to it way better than what Logan just did. Bro, I usually... Dude, dude. I picked that give intro him, music. Give him the other music. Smack it. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> God, now we're News intro. Channel 4. Um, <laughs> so enough Slapping. with shenanigans. Matt, what's the high score on um, this new game that we've been playing? We're in the Elkwoods currently. It's called Balls with a Z. <laughs> you don't have to giggle. It's a game by Catch App, if anybody uh, is familiar with extremely fun games. Definitely sounds phone. like this podcast is sponsored now. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's so, not uh, sponsored by Balls. <laughs> the record is 286 set by your boy, and I think next closest is 120. Logan, what's your high score? I hit 80. 80. Solid. Yeah, I haven't put a ton of time, you know. <laughs> it's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, though, we got a 12 uh, coming up. When you're out of service, I'm not a big gamer by any means, my wife is, but when you're out of service on a hunt, no cell whatsoever. We're on day number nine, no cell service. So we're using a lot of the Garmin itch in reaches to communicate via text to uh, loved ones back home. But a lot, a lot of downtime midday when things are hot, elk action is slow. And uh, Matt, I would even say when elk action's heating up. <laughs> That's like going in on a bowl. Yeah. <laughs> Matt whips out this game. And uh, I don't know how we were napping in the hot dirt one day. <laughs> no, there's, we'll, we'll dive into that later. But we were napping in the hot dirt, and uh, Matt is over there playing game, and Casey starts just, you know, taking a little gander over his shoulder, as did I. Like, what, what's this game you got going on here? And before you know it, Matt's phone was commandeered by the entire team. And uh, we burned through a lot of battery packs, keeping that thing charged to uh, rotate and play this game, Balls with a Z. It is like the most simplistic game ever created. Yeah. Uh, It actually reminds me of the old uh, Atari game. Pong. Not Pong. I just had it. Space Invaders? Space Invaders. There you go. Basically, you have some balls. That's what it's (laughs) called, balls. And you try to break all the blocks on the screen, and they can bounce back and forth and up and down, and you can collect more balls. And uh, so every time you... Every time you don't lose, you go on to the next. That's where Matt got 240. 286. 286. I apologize. <laughs> Put, some oh, respect. Put some respect on that. Dude. Jeez. Pers- yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm not a big gamer either, but I was watching. I was like, hey, Matt made the mistake. He's like, try it. So I tried it. And hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. I was caught. We uh, we finally, on day eight, had to roll into town, get some ice, take care of a cu- couple things. And we we came back, and every single one of us had it downloaded on our phone. <laughs> Casey uh, stayed up a little late last night. I think I might even download the game before I called my wife. When I <laughs> <laughs> Apologize, babe. Priorities. But uh, anyways, guys, it's it's the middle of September. We should get this podcast up here shortly, so it's it's pretty real time. But we are on an archery elk hunt. It is our first, at least the four of us, it's our first archery elk hunt. Eric's on a separate one um, in a different state. But we um, we had a good time, man. We are in a new area that we've never hunted before. And had good potential. I was. It's a tag that I was fortunate enough to get a hold of. Certainly something that we were all excited about. And so, anyways, we uh, we rolled down here with what I would consider the A team, and uh, we had to learn a new unit. Certainly did a lot of scouting ahead of time on Onyx, like we do anytime we learn a new area or uh, draw a tag in a new spot. So then, kind of for that 
second step is like getting boots on the ground. We're, we're, we weren't able to do any pre boots on the ground scouting, which means we're real time kind of scouting as the season is open. So we spent a couple of days kind of just driving around and learning country, looking for sign, sound checking for bugles, uh, doing all kind of the things to try to figure out like where are the elk now? Because certainly we had an opportunity to see old sign. And, you know, a lot of it's like, okay, old winter grounds. Here's some stuff where maybe they were rubs, but they were older, probably getting rid of velvet. And trying to, like, find where the cow's summering and all the details to really get into the action. So that took some time. Yeah. it. I mean, I think we do a fairly good job of checking boxes. So even though, it, we, you know, we went and started checking the areas we, Brian had pre-scouted through Onyx, Basically, we just started at the top of the mountain and started working down. So it's not a waste of a time. Like when you go out and you look at you go and look at an area and there's no elk in there at the time because then you can just check that off the box. And the more boxes we checked off, the more we could kind of isolate not just the country but the elevation these elk are living in right now because they're on definitely a transition where, you know, in the winter the bulls are up high wintering. Um, that's where they shed their antlers. That's where they grow their antlers. And then the cows spend most of their time down low where they summer, where they calf. And if the cows aren't going to find the bulls to rut. The bulls are coming down to go find the cows. So um, it's a transition. We, I still think there's bulls coming down um, for the most part. But, yeah, we checked a lot of boxes until we isolated this one area that seemed to have the most sign, the most fresh sign. And we, we found some elk. Finally found a little bit of elk. Um, it was, it's been, it, you know, it's been a grind of a hunt. Which I think is sometimes the case when you get into a new unit that you're not super familiar with, and you got to like, again, burn some time and energy and figure everything out. But that, there also is a ch- like the challenge and the grind and the difficulty adds to, I think the, you know, intrigue of learning a new area, trying to make all the puzzle pieces come together. We've met a lot of great people uh, that we've bumped into, which is always exciting. It's fun. Um, just another like cool thing that you get to experience out in the elk woods sometimes just running people sharing information and knowledge. Um, it was pretty cool, but overall today was a fun day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think you can emphasize, emphasize grind enough. Um, you know, we've been on some of these hunts where they're long, uh, you know, you, you got to work every day and hopefully, you know, you, I told these guys the other day, like, really like hunting for that opportunity right like we're hunting for the right opportunity especially hunting elk the way, way we like to do it and that is to either glass a bull up and then go put stocks on them or go try to call them in or just blind call and uh you're really hoping for that opportunity where the bull's in the right situation you're in the right situation and for whatever reason he decides to finally come in and, and offer a shot but yeah we experienced a lot before we found that opportunity that's for sure yeah, I heard a good analogy the other day that uh, c- calling for elk is a lot like fishing. You're just casting, casting, casting. Sometimes you'll get a nibble. Sometimes you'll get a hook and be able to land that sucker. So that analogy, I think, uh, translates to elk hunting really well. Can we throw in sometimes you hook a fish, reeling it in, getting it close to the boat, and then he comes off and you never get to see him? Never get to see him. Never. Never, maybe, maybe you just see a side of it. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> oh man, how big was he? Dude, he had a solid tail. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the shoulders on that fish. That was that was pretty much me and your life, Brian, for oh, the first man. first few days. So <clears throat> the way that, the way that we set it up was, me and Brian would go in, obviously, and then Casey and Matt would hang back and call. And going into it, that's that's like the experience you're chasing, right? In the, the elk woods, when you're calling, you want you want that bull to come in screaming in your face. <laughs> And it had happened to us a couple of times. Just never saw him. Yeah, the, the train was thick enough that it did a couple of things. Number one, it didn't wasn't really indicative to our favorite way to hunt elk, which is glass, big country, and then go find a bull and try to go make a move on it. You know, and maybe you call it in, maybe you don't. So that was a challenge. And then when we did have a few of our first opportunities, we had elk, you know, within a hundred yards or less, a couple, much less. One one as close as I think thirty yards, but it was just we never actually saw the bull, which is so frustrating, because you they were ripping too. They were just screaming their faces off. You could 
you know, hear their vocal cords ver- reverberating. Raking. Raking trees. I mean, breathing. Doing all the cool things that you want to experience. But then we didn't get to see it. So it's just like, oh, man. What was that? What Was it a raghorn? Not likely. Was it a giant? Maybe. Likely. Hopefully. And so that happened to Logan and I several times. Meanwhile, Casey and Matt would just sit back and the bulls would come <laughs> right to them in their lap. Back it's door. real easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's real easy if you make the right sounds. Yeah, we had a couple opportunities where we'd send these guys in. And, um, you know, that's kind of our program is when once you get a bull bugling, you kind of send the shooters in closer and hang back. The callers hang back maybe 100 yards and do some calling. And, you know, a lot of times, um, I don't care where you go, elk like to hang up. And I think the reason why is because they, like, want to see that sound. If they don't see that sound, maybe they don't feel safe or maybe get a little bit of wind of you or whatever it might be. But a lot of a lot of times a bull will hang up. And so if you send the, the shooters in closer, you know, the, the theory is to, you're going to get a bull to come at least past those guys and to get a shot. But, yeah, we hung back a couple times and call, call, call. And three different times, Matt, Maddie, uh just let me know. And, dude, we had bulls come right by us. Yeah, it was a... Uh, we literally had to stop calling once just because I was like, that bull will come, be right on top of us and we'll just spook him. Like, let's just stop calling and sit down. Yeah, he was pretty irritated. Came in, did circles for about 10, 15 minutes at like 80 yards just looking for us. And we literally cow called twice and he came running. Um, So something that like got reaffirmed in my brain this trip, it's the whole purpose of hanging callers back is elk get to a certain point where they're like, okay, I should be able to see what is making that noise. And if you're not in an open area where you have a decoy, where you can really suck them in that last 100 yards, like, because an elk will get to 80, 100 yards and be like, okay, if it's an open area, be like, I should be able to see the cow, see the bull. That's where kind of thicker terrain comes into an advantage because that bull a lot of times is like, I got to get inside 30, 40 yards to see what's making that rac- ruckus. But, uh, a lot of times when you hang a collar back, that elk is just like casually coming in or coming in quick, not even stopping to look, start dissecting the area to look for the cow that's making the noise. They're still just strolling in. Yeah. So I think that's that's something that uh, obviously a lot of people know. You see it on a bunch of hunting videos and stuff, but I can't I can't stress enough like we saw firsthand eight days, nine days in a row that if you can obviously play the wind, but it's pretty, pretty easy to get an elk's attention with calls. Whether they respond or not, that's another story. What? But if you can if you can get them hearing an elk noise and seeing something elk like, I mean, this time of the year, those bulls yeah, those bulls what, are willing to risk it all. That's what elk do. I, I love your point about thicker stuff because that that was um something I learned when we hunted with the Born and Race crew the first year down on the coast is you know those guys told us a couple things going into it there they told me there was two two rules their rules you had to shoot the first legal bull which is any branch out or bull and then draw when they tell you to draw i was like yeah okay i'm pretty sure i know when to draw like i hunted elk most of my life called a lot of bulls in but those bulls like the first bull i shot over there i shot at six yards and he had to come to six yards to see that sound it was so thick but he was willing to come there because he wanted to know what that was. And uh, we've hunted some open country where a bull won't come closer than two, 300 yards because they can see that far. And when I think when cows are calling a lot, they're moving. And so even though if it's semi-thick like it is here, like, and they stop at 80 to 100 yards, they feel like they'll eventually they'll see a cow mm-hmm. walking through the trees because it's open enough. Yeah. yeah. I think it goes back to why setup is so critical. Obviously, the wind component is, is really big picking a spot where you can be like in front of cover versus a lot of guys that are maybe more novice at elk hunting will sometimes set up behind like a bush or something, which generally doesn't work as well. So get in front of cover, always try to be, you know, tucked in the shade, good backdrop to kind of break up your, your outline, um, kicking out like your shooting feet. So you're not crunching on sticks and leaves if you need to pivot when the moment of truth comes. Uh, but the other thing is just like picking where to paste on your topography to set up. And like, you know, everybody's talking about right now, so many times elk will get to that point where it might be, you know, 60, 80, 90, hundred yards, depending on what the situation is, and they will stop. And if there was 
some topography where you could have got to the point where you expect them to stop, you know, chances are you're going to increase your opportunity to get a shot off and maybe kill the bull. But a lot of people will have a tendency to, you know, sit back a little bit. And there's that gap in space where the elk can see visually. And the minute they don't pick up an elk body or an elk resemblance, they're just going off sound. That's oftentimes when they're going to hang up. So we've used a lot of different techniques over the years. Like Casey mentioned, like the born and raised crew is pretty heavy, like cat road shuffle, which is just cover a ton of ground, call, 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 call. They're looking for one specific elk that's going to respond to their calls, hopefully come in and shoot it. So you may hike past a lot of bulls that are great, um, but they're just not fired up and ready to go. We've spent a ton of time over the years glassing, covering a lot of country with the, the vortex. And then, you know, like I mentioned earlier, finding a bull that we want to go make a move on and trying to go in and then maybe it's calling them in, maybe it's sneaking in. And then we've done some other things like this trip kind of reaffirmed like the success of just going in completely silent. Matt, um, you know, Matt was sharing some stuff like from other podcasts he's listened to. I think he said it was Randy Ulmer, who's just an absolute archery legend, talking about some tactics that he has used in different states where he will go in very early, locate the elk that are bugling at night, which is pretty common. They're partying, and he'll just kind of shadow the herd in the the depths of the darkness pre-first shooting hour's light. And he'll try to be within you know, a hundred yards of the herd with his good wind. And then when shooting light first happens, he's oftentimes killing bulls within the first 30 minutes of light. And we tried that tactic a few times, both at first light. And then also had a chance to kind of try to sneak in on a, uh, a, a midday bedded bull where we were doing some sound checking and something, a bull responded and Matt and Casey got him to talk enough that Logan and I could sneak in on him and we were able to get to 52 yards. It just didn't quite work out, but a couple of different tactics that we haven't used as much recently, but I think are very effective is just going in super stealth, not making it an ounce of call. And this is obviously assuming the bulls are, you know, staying vocal enough that you can kind of keep track of them and make that move. Yeah. I think it helped a lot too. We could tell that the, the bugle was a lazy bugle. Like instantly, I think Casey said, he sounds like he's bedded. And so that helped a lot, you know, just hearing his, and then pinpointing and, you know, playing the wind and stalking in. And obviously on a bedded bull, it's super easy to do rather than a bull on his feet who's perusing around. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, one of the keys to being successful, especially archery elk hunting, is to understand uh, the country and the terrain you're in, obviously, but also to understand the elk and what they're doing. You know, I think there's a lot of misconception out there that when September hits, elk are rutting and they rut till, you know, they're done and they're just always screaming their faces off, which isn't true. Like, the elk rut is all decided off a cow in heat. If you have a cow in heat in an area, the bulls are going to be going crazy. If you don't have a cow in heat in the area, the bulls are still excited because they know at any time a cow could go in heat, but maybe they're not so fired up because they can't smell, you know, the asterisk or whatever you want to call it. But I think knowing the situation is super key to being successful. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways we just talked about of uh, how to hunt elk, um, especially in September with a bow. And you, we used them all this trip, you know. Mm-hmm. We, we love to glass. We, we, we like to hunt, um, you know, some open, more open country. And uh, where we can really use the binos and the spawning scope to find the herd or find a specific bull we want to kill. Um, you can blind call like the board and race crew likes to do and try to f- look for that one elk that wants to play that game. Um, you can, you know, sound check, listen, you know, drive the roads, call. If you get a bugle, go in or, you know, spot and stock. But I just think knowing the situation and what we we're just talking about, We'd been calling all morning, and we knew this bull was working up the canyon, and he just got to a certain point, and he made that call, that one bugle that let us know he was in his bed. It's kind of like I was, would say, it like it's like a like it's not a it's like a yawn, a yawn almost. Like it's a yawn. I'm here, but I'm not getting up. I don't want to, you know, tango yeah. right now. But I'm here, and I think when they make that sound, that's when you really have to be. <laughs> crafty and you have to if you can get him to constantly bugle or even bugle every maybe 30 minutes to an hour where the guy's sneaking in can kind of 
get closer and then absolutely pinpoint where he's at. And the shooter's not making a noise. You just hold some guys back a couple hundred, 300 yards and call enough. To hopefully he'll respond and allow that shooter to get in, the, in there. And it worked really well. Yeah, I think yeah. what he gave us four from the moment yeah. we decided to stock him, he gave us four. Four bugles. And that was enough to, you know, and when, you, when you're when you getting close and you can hear him, you got to really slow things down. And something I noticed about you two that I never thought about, and I noticed this a while, but even though you're in tight cover and you're moving slow and you know you're close, don't be afraid to throw your binoculars up. Those things aren't just for long-range glassing. Like, you can really look through sticks and see. That's how, that's how you kind of found, it that, yeah. found that better. Both 50 yards through the binos, just taking it slow, p- panning over, getting low, changing – how tall you are, looking under branches, and just being as stealthy as possible. Yeah, at that point, you're really trying to find the bull before he finds you, he hears you, yeah. or sees you. And you got to use every advantage. Yeah, binos are huge. I always say I want to t- carry around like a pair of eight, eight buys with me just for that reason. But I'm always glassing in the trees, even if it's only like 80 yards. Yeah. You know. I think that's something a lot of people don't talk about, but that's definitely a key tool. For sure. Yeah, I think we experienced – Quite a few phases of the elk rut, I would say. I think uh, most of the bugling we were hearing was not quite the dominant bulls in the area. They were bulls that had collected cows and were like, these are mine, stay away. These are my cows. And they're trying to just keep control of 5, 10, 20 cows, you know. Just trying to hold that harem because yeah. they know it's close. They know that any day now. And then what I think the really mature dominant bulls are doing is they'll go down to the party grounds at night. They'll bugle a couple times, like flirting with the ladies, like, hey, what's up? Go and check in all the cows. And then I, I'm i a firm believer. They're the first up to bed, first bulls up the canyon. Because they're not dumb. They're like, we'll let that stupid satellite bull group those cows up for a, a whole two weeks while I sit up here and rest and get fat and happy. And then the second a cow goes in a heat, Game on. He'll go push that push that satellite bull off and I I that's my opinion, but I feel like we saw some of that and then what was it, two mornings ago when we when you guys got to thirty yards? I think there might have been some estrus in the air that day. Yeah. Those bulls were screaming on top of each other. You could definitely kind of felt like a little bit of tug of war yeah. going on between the two bulls. And we could hear a few cows down there in the bottom. But uh yeah. Definitely something had changed that morning. That's yeah. the other thing, too, is when Estrus does get in the air and say there is a cow in heat and the herd bull's on it, especially if he has more than, like, 10 to 15 cows, he's working his tail off trying to make sure they all stay together, they move, keeping other bulls out, and those satellite bulls, they're on it looking for their in. Oh, th- yeah. They're looking for their I shot. just think of, like, a cattle dog, like, working, yeah. just running around, all the cows trying to keep them in a circle. Scaring they're, off anything else. They're definitely opportunists at this time, especially when there's a cow that goes in heat. And we've witnessed this in some of the open country we've hunted is, you know, the big. And the one thing I would say is, especially like right now, we, I consider it's kind of pre rut down here. Like there's probably been some cows been bred, you know, there's probably some cows getting ready to go in, but it's not like full fledged right now. Um, but we've watched, and I was going to say like the, the, the big giant bulls aren't the ones running the cows all the time like mm-hmm. maddie said but i remember vividly this one morning uh in idaho we were watching a giant bull pushing like eight nine cows and on, there was probably five or six satellite bulls and one of the one of the satellite bulls would come in and try to hook a cow that the big herd bull would chase him off and then here comes the next satellite bull and so, like, they're doing anything they can to try to grab at least a couple cows, especially if there's one in heat. And so that herd bull is just working all day, nonstop, trying to keep those bulls away. And I, w- I would say if you're in an area and a cow's in heat, you're going to know it. And if there's elk in the area, obviously, but you're going to know it. There's going to be bulls screaming on top of each other. There's going to be a lot of commotion. And like Maddie said, we, we heard – we spent a lot of mornings just listening to bulls just call back and forth. Yeah. Communicate, And that's what elk are, like – they're, they communicate. They're very social animals. They like to talk, let the other bulls know where they're at. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is, is just knowing the situation and, and adapting uh, your technique to what's going on. I'm a big fan of the pre-rut dates of September. Um, a lot, Mostly because, man, we saw it even on this trip. There's a lot of 
some of those mature bulls that are not with cows yet, but they're they're around. They're close. And when they do have those mornings where they are kind of talking up a bit more, you know, I think you have a great opportunity to try to shoot a more mature bull in the pre-rut. Certainly can later in the year as well, but it gets more difficult when you add more eyeballs with cows and satellite bulls. So the pre-rut's been fun, man, like, which is, I don't know, I kind of consider the pre-rut, like, anything before September 15th, 16th time frame. And then I think it starts transitioning and getting, you know, more likely to have a true rut scenario. Also going to be dependent a little bit on weather, a little bit on the moon cycles. So we experienced um, not the greatest moon cycle. It was a full moon. Um, Matt kind of talked to us a little bit more about the majors and the minors of the moon and how that impacts potential estrus in cows and, I think that has a lot to do with their activity during the night. Because remember that first night we were camped in that canyon, full moon, and there was eight or nine bulls bugling around? I think that's full moon, their party mode, they can see what's going on. And then as the minors and majors changed, and the moon wasn't coming up until 3, 4 a.m., we weren't near, hearing near as many bugles until that moon came up. Even though it was a full moon, but the minors and majors were... Talk about Later. what are the minors and majors. So I get these confused, but minors and majors are basically sunrises and sunsets, but for the moon. So moon rises, moon sets. So um, I hunt with a used to hunt with a guide who would pay attention to those to the T. He would adjust his hunting tactics. He would adjust like times of the day he's hunting and calling, because days like on a full moon where the moon's up most of the night, he will hardly even hunt the morning. But he'll go hunt hard at noon because those bulls run it all night. Then they're resting in the morning. But then they get up to stretch their legs and goof off around noon or one. And that's when he's killing a lot of bulls. And right now, where the last few days, like the last two, three days, we didn't have a moon until 3 or 4 a.m. We are seeing way more activity in the mornings versus the one night where Casey and I called in the bull. You and Logan went in and got on the bull by that one water source up over the ridge in that evening, I think that was a night that we were going to have moon all night. So I I think you can overanalyze a lot of stuff when it comes down to it. Play the wind. If the elk aren't screaming, you shouldn't be screaming. You shouldn't just call just to make a bull bugle, in my opinion. Um, I think that's the number one mistake by most elk hunters. They just call to get a response. And... It's fun to hear an elk bugle. Like, it's it's so cool to be able to make a noise and get a response from an animal. But I think it gets overdone a whole lot. Like, let's say I bugle, locator bugle, bull bugles back. I shouldn't immediately cut him off unless I'm in strike zone, in my opinion. And uh, a lot of people will bugle their way all the way into a bull. And if that bull's smart and has cows, he's just going to keep his distance, keep pushing away from you. And if you were if you were thinking about it and you're like, okay, obviously that bull's bugling a lot. He's got cows. And he knows I'm here. I've had a locator bugle. In my opinion, if you're trying to be aggressive, you do a locator bugle. He responds. He's got his cows. You close that distance. Get in his bubble. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, I don't even like to call until I can see cows. And I know that's pretty dang close. But right then, I know that I'm in striking distance 100%. I'm in his bubble. I'm in his bedroom. I'm with his cows. And then I just throw a challenge bugle. And I killed so many elk guiding that way. One locator bugle, one challenge bugle. I bugled twice, killed elk almost almost daily that way. And uh, I think that's number one mistake. Some people just call to hear elk talk. And, I mean, it's really fun. But uh, here's, here's, you got to gauge the situation. Here's my take on this. And I've thought about this for a while. It's crazy how much in the driver's seat your callers are. Like if you're lucky enough to hunt out there with buddies and you have callers that are dropped back behind you, the way the way I kind of look at it is it's an A, a B, and a C in a straight line, right? In a perfect scenario, you locate the bugle, you get set up, A is the bull, B is the shooter, C is for caller, obviously, right? Duh. C for caller. Why isn't the bull the B then? It's just A, B, C line oh, Okay. So <clears throat> your your callers have to have their head on a swivel. Because you can't talk to the shooter. And we experience this. Like if we need to move up or anything like that. 
but their head is on a swivel to the point where they know when to call, what calls to make, and if that bo- if A is kind of deviating, C needs to keep their he- head on a swivel and kind of move to keep that line coming got, to the shooter. They've got to time. keep the shooter center of the clock. Yeah, so you got to look at A, B, C, and as a caller, you got to really make the. It's like being in a drift boat, right? So the guy on the oars is the real driver, and the guy on the line is the shooter. There's a lot of truth to that. I think there's importance too of knowing when not to call. Yeah, it's yeah. probably more valuable than even than when to call or whether you're raking or how much cow calls or what volume. There's just a lot of variables that are dependent on each situation. But I think we experienced this week too that like Colin wasn't super effective in most of our situations. And we also run into some other hunters in the woods that were nearby that were also calling, maybe more so than we were. Very call positive. <laughs> call call positive. Call and, heavy. <laughs> and, um, you know, we tried to use what they were doing to our advantage by doing the opposite. So if they're calling heavy and we're kind of working the same elk, unfortunately, um, you know, there's an opportunity there to sneak in undetected. And that was pretty successful. Yeah. We didn't kill on those attempts, but it was still very s- successful. Not not saying if you're in the woods and you hear somebody calling a bull and sneak in. It was just like yeah, no, not happenstance like that. for sure that it worked out. I like that. I feel like we do a very good job of taking the back back seat if, in those situations. If we're sneaking in on a bull, we've done it numerous times. We're sneaking in on a bull, bugling, and we can clearly tell there's a hunter there. We always back out. Yeah. This situation. A couple was, situations we've had where we were the ones going yes. in on the elk, and someone was behind us, and they tried to make a play around. But you know. If, it frustrates you, but it is what it is. Sometimes maybe they didn't know it. we were there. Um, Try whatever to pass it might your be. truck. Yeah. <laughs> trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, but, I know, I know. You know, long story short, you know, everyone's out here trying to do the same thing, hopefully. Yeah. And I mean, again, my tactic was at that point we were we were in the zone. We were in yeah. the bubble. And I I felt that the right call was just to stay in the bubble and try to go in stealth mode and you know, take advantage of the unfortunate situation that we were in and try to capitalize. And it didn't work out at the time, but we got, we got a W in the sense that we were within 30 yards of a a bull that was going bananas. Um, it got bumped for reasons unknown, allegedly, but we'll leave that off for a different topic for a different time. But anyways, uh, it was still awesome. Like it was great. We, we had an up close encounter, and I think, man, the drive for me for archery elk hunting is those up close encounters. Yeah. Great to see the actual elk when you hear them bugle and you're up close, but equally as fun to just be in the mix, man. When they're screaming and they're doing their thing that they're supposed to do, that's what we live for. And so, to me, those were wins. Yeah. And on these hunts where we don't know the unit, it's a new area. We're trying to just learn. It's still early in September. It's hot. Like the temperatures have been. We got a couple. Of big rain kind of dumpings, but it's been hot. It's been in the eighties, um, you know, with like temperatures, maybe low 45, 50. So not super chilly full moon. We've got all these variables that are ne- not necessarily in our favor, but we're just working towards it every day, hoping that one of those days it's going to like finally connect and pay off. I think the biggest obstacle we faced was a couple of those storms that kind of lingered for half the hunt or more was well, yeah. just the wind, man. Yeah. We could never get a steady breeze, and today we had a stiff breeze. Today was the most steady breeze we've had. And even mm. though it was poor at the beginning and we had to swing clear around, when it was go time and we finally had an opportunity, we yeah. could kind of lean on the wind a little bit, being like, okay, it hasn't deviated all day. I well, mean, we've experienced this a few times this year, me and you, Matt. So there's two different types of wind. There's wind that's either pushing a storm in or pushing a storm out, typically. And then you have the thermals. So thermals will be going up when it's, the air is warm and coming down when the air cools down in the evening. Well, you can't, when there is wind, you can't really rely on either of them because the thermals are still trying to do their thing. But then you have this wind gust that might be doing the complete opposite. And sometimes you can use that to your favor. Like we did this year in Nevada. We were hunting mule deer. We found a buck, um, went in on him. Thermals should have been going up at this time. Um no, they were going, going to down. be going down because it was evening, and so we were worried about that. But there was a storm blowing in that was overriding the thermals. It was pushing up. 
And so me and Matt sat there for a long time trying to decide. And finally, we're like, you know what? This storm's pushing in. Let's just count on that. N- not the thermal, but the actual wind blowing up. And it worked. Yep. Yeah, man. I mean, I've said this several times in my mule deer versus elk argument. Uh, basically, get the wind in your face on an elk and run at it most of the time, you know? If if cover is uh, is working in your favor, obviously. But, like... Noise is not really that big of an issue most of the time. Uh, elk are loud animals, uh, and yeah. uh, they they uh, walk pretty loud sometimes. But they can be stealthy, especially when a bull's sneaking in quietly. But, uh, I mean, how many times were we on bugling bulls this trip, and the wind was just garbage? Yeah. And they either shut up because maybe they caught a whiff of us, or we had to completely change our whole route on the elk because we're like, there's no sense in continuing this line. We're just going to blow them out anyways. So, I mean, as hunters this week, it was more of a mental challenge all week, mental grind than a physical grind because, like, physically we were we were killing it. Like yeah. 8, 10, 12-mile days, and, I mean. Early mornings. We were cruising, guys, and, I mean, Cause just I mean, a mental grind. Like, in all – like, if you had a perfect scenario, it's like you could almost say lift all the trees off the ground and see that bull at 600 yards or whatever and call him, watch him bugle, and he'd walk all the way to you and you shoot him at 20, but that never happens. Hey, the other night, Maddie and Logan were talking about what superpower they – if they could have a superpower, what would it be? That has always been my super, my, my wish for my superpower. Pick all the trees up? To be able to pick all the vegetation up off the ground for, like, 30 seconds, and I can see everything. And then the vegetation will, will come back down. My number two superpower, so number one was transporter, being able to teleportation. Teleport. Number two, I always thought it would be cool, like driving. If there was like t- um, hologram icons above like animals or sheds as I'm driving, <laughs> yeah. just like ding, 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 ding. Dude, like, like that, oh, that like mountain has buck, a lot of elk. Big Buck Hunter back in the day on easy mode, the red dot would be wherever the deer is and the I trees was gonna or say, whatever. You guys have played way too many video games. <laughs> And can now you, me after this week. Can you imagine <laughs> yeah. just sitting on a hill and just being like, ding, 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 just like holograms <laughs> moving above the trees, and you're like, oh. Do you get coins if you if you kill them? Potentially. <laughs> Still working on that. Part. Buy new skins for your bow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, th- and like I told you guys, and I said this earlier in the podcast, I always look at every hunt. A couple ways I look at every hunt, like what are going to be the challenges. And typically, I'll come up with a list that I think is going to be our challenges, and they're usually different, or there's a couple more I didn't think about. Just some oddballs. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, when is that opportunity, like, that we've been hunting for going to happen? And it goes back to all this stuff, like, when is that bull going to be fired up enough to come in? When are we going to get on a bugling bull and our wind is right? Like, when are all those things going to come together that we have the, the best opportunity to kill a bull? And usually that's when all those things happen and you've hunted hard enough to find that opportunity, that's usually when you find success, in my opinion. And then that's what keeps you coming back. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh, the other challenge, man, was uh, we're, we're kind of a swing shift crew historically, <laughs> meaning we're not, generally speaking, getting up at 3 in the morning and We've been able to find success in other ways, and a lot of those ways don't require to be out super, super early. It's part of the reason I'm not a waterfowl hunter. Just, man, I can't. My body doesn't operate well. Better than Logan, but not well. Whoa. (laughs) I did pretty saltless. You want to talk about naps? I'm going to call them out. Should we talk about naps? Logan and Maddie, we've said this over the years, they're the shot getters. Shot getters. Getting the shots means taking a nap (laughs) in the hot hot dirt. In the hot dirt. In the hot dirt. (laughs) First three days of this hunt, there was one point I looked at Maddie and Logan. I go, dude, I think Brian has COVID. <laughs> He's got the long haulers. Just a side effect from COVID, dude. Just long haulers. <laughs> he was napping more than I've ever seen Brian nap. I was whipped. <laughs> no doubt. The drive down was long. We had a couple evenings where we stayed up way too late and then had a very early alarms. Yeah, dude, I was born. I'm getting old, guys. Like, I got to get eight hours of sleep and three, four hours. He's got to get eight hours of sleep and he's got to eat dinner before six <laughs> pretty much okay. i'm getting close to senior like your discount ends at six at sizzler <laughs> that's right. like a gremlin like don't get water on yeah the sunlight <laughs> but we were we were setting the alarm early man like we were having to get up at freaking four threes yeah. and that's well, not 
common. The, no. the, the reason why is because we adapted. Yep. Because these bulls, you know, would call until 7, o'clock. 7 a.m. on the head. That's one hour of daylight, basically. Yeah. So first light was at 6, right? Yeah. Sunrise was at 6. First light's like 5.40, and 5.30. The, we've noticed this the last three days. At 7, like we looked at our clocks this morning and we we're like, 7 a.m. They caught, quit bugling again. It's like 6.59 and like, <laughs> and then just crickets. And we're just like, seriously? <laughs> yeah, crazy. Like yeah. it was the coldest morning by far. Yep. Like the moon was as small as it had been the whole trip. And then morning before, bulls were screaming. And this morning, just like crickets. Yep. It's like, wow. But that's why, you know, we're like, if we're going to get into some bugle in action, we got to get up. Get out there, listen to where they're at, and uh, hopefully get on them before they quit at 7. Yeah. And then the, in the evenings, the evenings were by far slow Super compared slow. to the mornings, you know. We were camped in an area that uh, maybe a little too close mm. to the bedroom, yeah. but uh. there was bulls that would be bugling at night, and then we'd wake up in the morning and basically plan our hunt yeah. off where the bulls were at. I would say we were in the pantry. Pantry, not quite the bedroom. We, I mean, we you got to be nimble, too. I, I tell a lot of people that ask advice, maybe they're going on their first elk hunt or something, like, what do you suggest? And I think it's important to be nimble. You know, like, you might have in your mind from e-scouting or other information you've gathered, like, this is where I'm going to hunt. And you get there, and then the hunting's not that good. There's not that elk. There's no elk around. Yeah. you got to be nimble. So we picked a camp spot and got got the team lodge kind of base camp here that we're sitting in currently recording this podcast which has been fantastic i was so sad to leave it super nice uh enclosed like trailer that we that we have that is uh really comfortable the ultimate hunting trailer yeah period and so we unfortunately though like spent some time up here and saw some elk and what have you but it just wasn't that great and we made a few long drives and we're finally like all right we gotta just we gotta relocate so let's uh, let's be nimble and like let's just throw like the bivy tents in and freaking move. And so we packed all our stuff up, moved to a different part of the unit, and it paid it paid dividends. Like we were in the pantry, we were hearing bugles, we were in the mix more consistently. And uh, I think that's a key thing, right? Is just like being willing to pack up shop and relocate, even though that was not plan a or maybe even plan b yeah originally coming down here like that was our plan is we were going to backpack for you know five or six days and we got down here and realized that you know that might not be the most efficient way to hunt yeah. i think i think the way, best way to put it is for this hunt and all other hunts being able to adapt yeah, yeah. And period also i think too like i got i got to speak to this is through all what we've talked about you really have to adapt to the experience you want to have if you want to backpack go and backpack maybe it's not going to be the best for finding all the elk but if that's the experience you're wanting then go and do it if you're wanting to hear elk bugle and maybe get a chance to call a satellite bull in go make a lot of elk noises like i always say everyone should be able to go and have the experience they're seeking in the woods if it's legal and it makes sense right and ethical ethical yeah and so if you're if those are the things you're wanting to do out of out of a hunt, like go and do those things. We really want, you know, to go and, and try to kill a big bull and, and get rad footage for you guys at the end of the day. And you know, we love calling elk, we love having that, that elk in our face bugling, but sometimes it's just not the situation it's not gonna happen. And we adapted and changed up and we kinda gotta experience all of it. We did. We at did the indeed. End of the day. So the twenty two season is off to um a pretty solid start. And uh, these guys have spent time chasing mule deer with a bow. They've spent time in the great north of Alaska chasing caribou. Just now sliding into elk season. Can I just say this real quick? Like, say it. This podcast is probably going to come up, come out. And you guys are listening to it before we re- release our season. We are going to do it a little differently this year. We are. But man, I'm excited for it. Like, Lo- Logan, <laughs> walk us through what. I you just want to say this real quick. Yeah. Did you feel this? Because I hope you felt this. I told you this. This is the first hunt Brian's been on with us. We had two bangers coming into this. Yeah. Our first yeah. two hunts were bangers. 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 That's what I'm saying. Like, we found some success. We had, like, both of them were very, very different. Grinding. Grinding. And so I was told Brian to go, don't screw this up, man. We're on a roll. 
<laughs> yeah, no pressure. <laughs> but mind you, just to set the stage here, so like, you know, every, we all have wives and families back home that um, we, you know, these guys have been away from a lot. We had some earlier tags materialize this year, so a lot of road travel, which uh, Matt and Logan's wives have young kids to attend to when they're gone and a lot going on. And um, so there was a lot of, I felt a lot of pressure because the three of these guys are sacrificing their time with their family to come and help me. There's only one tag in camp, not two or four or whatever. And so, uh, and it was one of those tags where you kind of want to put some time in too. It wasn't, we didn't expect it to be like a quick three, four day success thing. We figured if it was going to work out, it probably was going to take, you know, upwards of 10 days. And that's a lot to ask based on what we've already done this season. So uh, as we're rolling through to day nine, feeling a little bit of pressure, uh, not only for just like let's make a cool, you know, experience and get to hopefully have some success, but also like, man, if I have these guys away from their families for 10, 11 days and we don't get anything out of it, that that's a huge letdown in my mind. Dude. This morning, like, I could tell you were feeling the pressure, and I felt like it was going to be a magical day. You were very, you expressed your gratitude to us individually. Yeah. And that was awesome, man. It's, like, I always feel this. You two are good dudes, and, like, you show your appreciation by your actions and the way you respect us and treat us, but, like, damn, is it good to hear, like, some affirmation like you guys are killing it we appreciate you like and just to put it in context like what bmac's talking about our season started august 8th it is now september 16th 16th and we've been gone this is day 28 on the road already this year i mean that's a lot we're putting in some work yeah we can't ever tell our wives all of us thank you enough for allowing us to do this you know, I always make the joke of, you know, when talking to somebody and explaining to them what we do, I'm always like, it's a little easier to get in the woods now. That's our job. But saying that, we are in the woods way more than we've ever been before we started doing this. And me and Brian have been doing this for a long time now. And we're kind of on a rhythm at home. And uh, Maddie and Logan, Logan's been doing this now for five years with us. So he's kind of getting that rhythm. Maddie was a guide, so his wife kind of knows. But those guys are the true rock stars yeah and uh there's a lot going on at home but they allow us to come out here and and do this do this for a full-time job which is awesome yeah and i think once the season releases like you've already seen the elevated quality in my opinion of what we've been able to produce over the years and matt and logan are just so in sync now with like how they work together like their creative abilities to bring a piece together their knowledge of all equipment and editing and it's it's fun to listen to them it it sounds like a foreign language to most of us and if you give us a camera we're not very good at it we always give them a hard time they're talking like anytime we're with anybody else that has their camera guy it's straight to camera talk yeah right if it's with the born and raised crew and their camera guy um steven drake steven drake whatever it is Uh but a lot of people ask you know how do you get into filming hunts you know i would say just go and do it film with whatever you have but if you're really looking at a career in, in the outdoor filming industry, dude, you got to be passionate about it because that's a lot of hard work. Like yeah, we've just man. been talking, you're gone a lot. And what I love to see with our camera guy, camera guys, Logie and Maddie, is they're so so passionate about it still. Like they get stoked on each other for getting the shot, get stoked on each other when there's something awesome that happens and it all gets captured. Like they're passionate about the filming side of our business. And that's why they are the best camera guys in the business. It's going to be fun to see everything come out together for 2022. So Casey kind of mentioned it. We did best season yet for a lot of years, um, four consecutive years where it was kind of a, we, we continue to adapt. Year one was a daily video of our fall season, which also included a lot of personal stuff, behind the scenes vlogs. Some people really liked it. that were super interested in following the the brand and, some people were like, just show me hunting stuff, which I get. It's a lot. That was a lot. We had 84 videos consecutively, which was a pile to do. 84 days in a row. In a row. That's Ooh. a lot of yeah. in the field. You got to be out there enough to capture that. Yeah. Or at home, whatever. 
But, dude, to, like, the back end of that. Dude, the logistics of being, like, Eric's on a hunt, Brian's on a different hunt, Casey's at home, and just getting all that footage together. A lot of, I would say a lot of fluff. Yeah. I look back on that now, and I'm like, man, that was that was remarkable that we were <laughs> organized enough to do I that. I think, for- remember that, that <laughs> big poster? I went to Walmart, yeah. bought a poster board, <laughs> yep. drew out all the months and who was responsible for what footage and sent a picture. And you guys were stoked on it, but in hindsight, like, it was silly. It was like an art project. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how, yeah, like, ruler. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember back if we lost footage or, I don't know, but, like, we did 84 days in a yeah. row. Yeah. That's, that's somebody sitting behind a computer for eight or more hours a day for 84 days straight. It was, yeah, that was hours. when Eric and I did a lot of cutting with Logan. Yeah. And it probably wasn't the best because we know how to cut. You know, we started this business yeah. by me and Eric filming and cutting, but for sure. we brought the professionals on now. <laughs> yeah, so we pivoted then year two in Best Season Yet to kind of showcase more just hunting. Yeah. But it was still a lot of day-by-day stuff, which some people really like, right, because they feel like you're along the hunt. They can watch each hunt unfold, and sometimes the hunt's going to be one or two days, and you're going to have success, or you got to go. Other times you might have six or seven days, and you don't get anything. You get a lot of cooking back at camp a lot of cooking at camp (laughs) but it's very real and we try to always showcase real you know authentic hunting and again some people loved it and some people were like man i don't have who has time to watch videos every day like i don't so over the years like we've we've kind of looked back at like what have been some of the more successful videos that we've ever produced and we have enough history in our youtube library to go back and kind of explore that and one thing started to, to stand out, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with the fact that media consumption is changing, you know, by the day. And when we first started the channel, smartphones were really popular to watch content on. So a lot of people were watching our videos, which a lot of those videos were maybe 10 to 15 minutes in length. Pretty digestible on your phone. But now the advent of streaming services... You know, Netflix is huge. Hulu is huge. Freaking YouTube TV is huge. Like, so many streaming services. Also, many more smart televisions. So you look at the back end of our analytics and you kind of see, man, there's a lot of people watching these videos sitting down on the couch with their family on the big screen, which is super cool. Very different than when we first started. And so as we look through those uh, back successful videos, a lot of the ones that have like the most amount of views and the most amount of engagement were longer form videos, typically 40 to 90 minutes in length. Think Hush Life the Movie, Hush Life the Movie 2.0, Time and Pressure, Find a Way. Like a lot of these ones really stood out and those were showing like the most amount of engagement. So we're going to try something new. new, Not necessarily new, but just different. We're not going to do the best season yet, day by day stuff. Logan, what do you uh, what do you have in mind for the folks, <sighs> ladies and gentlemen, listening to this podcast? Twenty twenty two is going to be spectacular. I think we have the team. <clears throat> I think we have <clears throat> the camera and the editing power to really bring you guys something great. In the sense that my goal is going to be that we need to give you guys the best of the best without getting rid of what makes us us. We're not going to be cutting out the stuff you guys love, cooking, joking, all that stuff, but we want to give you the best of the best, and we're going to look at each hunt as its own piece. So we will be releasing our hunts all together in one video, the best of the best content we can do once a week for all of you at home. And I think it's going to be a great improvement. It's, you know year after year after year always on my mind is how can we improve right how 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 can we be better for you guys and maybe more people out there that haven't heard of us or seen us and i think this is going to be the best route um it's going to be on a schedule one video every week best of the best content for that hunt and uh that's what i want to do for you guys that's what i think i think we all agree as a agree agree as a group that that's going to be the best thing is um, really focus on each hunt, make it special and make it its own thing instead of forcing it to fit. I don't want to force things to fit. I want each hunt to be its own thing. Yeah. And that's so my goal. Basically if we're going to be doing every hunt that we go on. So this elk hunt will be its own film. 
and we'll release them once a week. Um, Which I think is more digestible, man. People are busy. One video a week, I think it's totally doable. But, man, anymore, like, there's so much more content being released. A lot of people releasing hunting content are still doing the day-by-day stuff, which worked in our eyes for a lot of years. But I think it's time to pivot and try some different things. And Dude. I, I'm excited about it. I, I like to be able to sit down and watch a, a video that tells a story, that maybe creates some emotion, yeah. that maybe, like, takes you to a place in your mind that, you know, brings you happiness or, again, some kind of emotional connection to that video. Maybe it, it brings you back to when you were hunting with your dad or your buddies or you know, your family or something. And I think this gives us a better opportunity to do that. We don't feel forced to have to just like put content together that doesn't, maybe isn't that great, frankly. And so I'm super excited to see how this shakes out. And then I love the idea of like being able to put on a, a video that's 45 to 60 minutes long, no different than like a episodic net Netflix series where yeah. every week, you know, you got a 45 minute long video. And I think hopefully if we can continue to have some success and showcase some of these other hunts we have on the on the calendar, we're going to have, I think, arguably our, our best stuff we've ever produced. This is what I would say. Just something that you can sit down with yourself or your family once a week and watch and not, not feel forced like, oh, I missed uh, day one, day two. Just something that you can sit down and watch and it's an experience, right? It's something that you're not like, in a drive through or on break at lunch, just trying to catch a, a peek. Like we, we want it to be an experience for you guys. We want like, what's the next step, right? We can't obviously have all of you there with us, but we want to create an experience that you can sit down once a week and just be immersed. I absolutely love, um, when we are wherever, like expos at a show, whatever, and, and people come and talk to us. I love when there's a family, that comes by our booth or wherever and they're talking to us and they say, yeah, we w- sit down and watch, you know, your movie premiere every, like as a family every week, like we'll sit down on Sunday and watch a movie of your guys's and we all love it because it's something that we're super, super passionate about is getting the youth excited about the woods. If it's fishing, hunting, whatever it might be. And so I think like Brian and er- Logan just said, it's going to be a very consumable product for you this year because you know there's only be going to be one video every week and that maybe you just plan your movie night around it where you sit down and you watch it with your family and hopefully getting the kids excited about it like that's what i absolutely love about our business we've always stayed true to that is family friendly content and to get people excited about the woods and especially the youth yeah it's going to be it's going to be amazing just looking over some of the stuff we've already captured i just i can't wait um I, you know i look back at some of those longer form films we've done and they are some of my favorite, really. And it's cool because we've had the chance to have Matt and Logan out together on multiple hunts already this year, which sometimes, you know, we have to divide and conquer. Eric's on a hunt in a different state right now. And um, that kind of comes with the territory. We can't always all be together. But when you have two different camera guys creating two different angles, building like two different storylines that come together, it, it's pretty sweet. Like, I, I love watching stuff with multiple angles to be able to like create the finished product oh can we shout out our cam- new camera guy yeah our uh part-time part-time we brought a third camera guy on this year um trying him out he sounds like he's doing a good job he's been with it with eric in colorado so eric's colorado hunt will be a, a film this year um shout out Braden. yeah old Braden. uh big time crit his first hunt that's a that's a doozy that's a backpack eight well, i think they were only out seven days this time but like six to eight miles in there and that country is not easy and i know they were packing camp on their back almost every day so i mean he's baptized by fire get thrown right throw in. him into the fire catch catch 22 like that's the best opportunity to shine yeah you're in those hard ones yep no pressure Braden. <laughs> <laughs> better be a banger <laughs> we yeah. got we got three in the hopper yeah, we got you, three you better make it four you're uh gonna be contrasted against uh some pretty, pretty Not epic really adventures. Not really fair, dude. They might have <laughs> no, been teamed yeah. up on the first three. <laughs> Consider this as like a uh, an entry level, you know, opportunity to learn. Yeah, yeah. And uh, dude, and he's rocking my baby, man. I sent him literally my whole, I know, my whole starting setup. He's got yeah. my body, my lens, my well, cage, my laptop. Everything. He's in, he's in good hands with two great mentors. Yeah, that's yeah for without sure. doubt. Can we? How many uh, hunts did you figure we were gonna have? 
23 different hunts. So we have 20 well, 23 roughly, tags. Roughly. 23 tags. Roughly, we have 23 tags in our pocket this year. Um, Which so includes you're still going to be a ton of content. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's still going to be a ton of content out there. I think maybe we're going to get to a point like maybe we have to do two a week. We don't know yet. We'll just have yeah, to see how like, the season goes. Like I would say very comfortably, I, I feel like I can say this, at least 18 films this year. Even because Alaska was so epic. It's part one and two. So yeah, that like adds we'll one. split that. We'll just, we just have to see how everything's going to shake out. We never know. That's the hardest thing about trying to prepare a season is you just don't know what's going to happen. We could have got on these three hunts, and they could have just been duds. 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 Like, like Logan said, nothing's going to be forced. And that's the best part about this season is not only from like our filming standpoint, but our editing freedom. We're able just to like tell the story how it needs to be told. We're not forced on time constraint. We're not forced on episodes. We can just tell it the best way that will immerse the viewer to where it literally – like Logan says, it's going to be an experience. I want I want people to feel like they're there with us. They experience the highs, the lows, the funnies, the sads, the angries. the hot dirt, <laughs> and the and angries. <laughs> we had some angries this week. We did. I feel like I'd I'd say we ha- we had some fussies. We had some. I, I do want to talk about this a little bit because I think it tells uh, it tel- tells the story of of a grind, basically. Yeah. You know. When we came out on this hunt, like Brian said, we knew it was going to be tough um, going into a new area. Even though, you know, we know the tag, it's a special tag that Brian got this year. But we know going into an area, it's going to be tough. It might take a few days to figure it out. And uh, like we talked about earlier, it's it's a lot weighing on everyone's shoulders because we are gone uh, from our families. And so, you know, but going into it, there was some frustration. Not going into it, but like during the hunt, there was some frustrations some moments, we'll call them, of just, you know, somebody wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> somebody, you know, goes to where the guy told them that it's not the right spot. <laughs> but, dude, at the end of the day, I told these guys this. Man, that's what makes up a hunt is when you go through, all, you experience those things, some frustrations, um, some challenges. But then you come together as a team and you accomplish the goal. And that's what we experienced on yeah. this hunt. And, uh, and here's the thing, man. Everybody's striving for the exact same outcome, yep. which is success. And we run a pretty diplomatic ship. Wait, no. We run a pretty yeah. de- democratic. No. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. We have Everybody, democracy. Everybody yeah. has yeah. input, right? And, like, when I'm the tag holder or anybody's the tag holder, we typically are always saying, hey, what do you guys think? And it's genuine. Like, I respect yeah. everybody's opinion. Um, Matt has been on a ton of hunts where they've had success over over the, his lifetime as a young guy. Casey and I have been on so many hunts together. Like, I trust him like my right hand. And so I, when I ask, like, hey, man, what do you guys think? I mean it. Logan has been on my shoulder for so many hunts. And when we're in the moment, it's him and I. Like, I'll always say, what do you think, dude? Should we move? What are your thoughts? Like, I think – working as a group you can come to a better outcome sometimes than just trying to like always have the answer yourself particularly when you're holding a tag that has a lot of pressure to it and so sometimes with those type of situations when you are asking for a lot of input not everybody's going to have the same feedback people are going to have different opinions and sometimes that's where you might get frustrated with each other a little bit like dude what are we doing like why i would do this instead and again looking at like the bigger picture, it's like everybody wants the same result. We might have to do, make some sacrifices where it's like, okay, my decision didn't win this time, yeah. but let's just roll with it and see what happens. And it all it all worked itself out. I know that, and man, we don't have many issues as a group ever. We haven't historically in the years that we've done this. But every now and again, you know, people are tired. People have been gone away from home a lot the situations uh, and challenges that get thrown to you, whether it's weather or, you Mosquitoes, know. heat. <laughs> yeah, you name it. Like, <laughs> anything can just add to that. But anyways, like, overall, nothing was outlandish. It's all stuff that we're laughing about in hindsight. Um, but I think it's just all rooted from everybody wants this to be successful. 
And sometimes somebody just wants to know what the heck we're even doing out here. <laughs> <laughs> but to Brian's point, like that's that's a wise outlook on it because I've had the tag where I'm the tag holder and I'm so tunneled vision and just like singular line A to B I see an animal I'm gonna go kill it and a lot of times when I bump the animal because I'm by myself or with somebody else that I'm not asking their opinion it's it I bump the animal and I'm like what the heck but like Brian's saying if you can really take a step back and ask questions you may hear different points of view that like, holy crap, that really makes sense. Like maybe we should try that idea or no, man, that doesn't, I don't really, no, I'm not feeling that idea. Like let's stick to this plan. And I think that's the biggest, biggest pro to our team right now is we're four grown men out here for nine days. I mean, it's, it's not big things that are getting on each other's nerves at this point. But uh, what I'm trying to say is the coolest thing about this group of dudes is let's say somebody's idea didn't work or somebody's idea worked better than yours. We're all humble enough or man enough to admit, man, I'm glad we chose your idea. Shoot, my idea sucked. Like, my bad. Like, that wasn't a good plan. And I think that's the coolest thing is we can admit that we screwed up or – I, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's it's a humble no, group of dudes, and it's the truth. It's and I I just compare it like I do a lot of things in the woods to life. You know, you're gonna have to work with different people. Um, if it's a job, if it, you know your coach, whatever it might be, like you're gonna work with different people that have different opinions. But everyone's opinions should be valid in a sense that everyone's had different experiences, and you know we've all hunted elk multiple times in different places and different times of the year. And we've all seen things, you know, happen in certain times. And so, like, and that's why I think that we are so open to, to everyone's opinions just because at the end of the day, no one knows for sure anything. They just know what they've learned from experiences. Yeah. And we've all had such different experiences that it's 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 just always best to work as a team. And that's what happened is, you know, we had a lot of input during this hunt. All of us did. And at the end of the day, when it was all successful, you know, we came together as a team, which we, coming into this, I told Brian, I said, man, if it was me, I would, you know, these three guys are who I would want out there in the woods with me. Yeah. It was great. The, um, the, the hunt ended successfully today, which is, uh, just awesome. So I'm so thrilled by it. And, um, the part that I love the most, so like, we tried a lot of different tactics this week and some of the times it was just me and Logan like in the mix. Right. And it could have went down that way, but the way it went down, we were all in the mix. We, everybody got to have the visual experience, the audio experience. And we were there as a unit, which to me was the coolest part about the whole hunt because it still would have been fun, but man, if Casey and Lo- if Casey and Matt were laid back, calling and like hundred yards away, they couldn't see, they didn't know idea what happened. Would not nearly has been as amazing as the way it went down today. Yeah, without a doubt, I think um, you know going into a hunt, we always, I always try to picture how it's going to go down. If it goes down, like how, what's that going to look like? Is it a bull bugling in your face at twenty yards? Is it stalking in on a bull? And just, there was eight days of just frustrations and ups close and do- downs, close calls that led to that moment that we were hunting for that opportunity. That we finally found and it went down and uh, some of the most epic fashion that we've dude, ever experienced. People say it all the time. There's two lines, preparation and luck. And when they cross, good things happen. Well, when it finally happened. happened, I looked at Brian, and I go went down just like we drew it up didn't it? <laughs> which is the absolute that's be, opposite of what, what happened but yeah i uh we're excited to put this one together and maybe we'll we'll dive more into specifics on another podcast but uh i hope you guys are enjoying your september it's a special time man it really is and if uh, if you have an archery tag in your pocket hopefully you've already been out or you can't have a chance to get out again get excited it's it is just my favorite time of the year we got a bunch of great stuff on the docket. Hunts left to fulfill. We'll be hunting, man, really solidly through the end of the year. 
We're not even touching halfway yet. You're not even, dude. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> not even a quarter. <laughs> we got some exciting announcements coming up uh, later in October, and um, make sure you stick around for those. We don't have this podcast sponsored. We just get on here and talk about things that are interesting to us. Some of it's business and entrepreneurship. Some of it's diving into hunting recaps. Some of it's, you know, tactics and what have you. Do kind of a lot of random stuff, but it was really just designed as another way to kind of talk in longer form uh, that maybe wasn't, you know, wasn't what you could capture from video. And so we made a conscious effort to try to do more of them. We'll continue to try to do that. But by all counts, if you, uh, if you are interested in helping us out, you can jump on our website at gethushin.com. We've got a bunch of fantastic merch on there. You can also help us out by using our discount codes. we got a, a few of them. It saves you some money, helps us out a little bit. So OnX Maps is one that we have used for a lot of years. You can use the discount code HUSH. saves you 30%. If you don't have the map on your phone, you should definitely check it out. We literally live on it. We download offload maps. We use it for our GPS tracking. We drop waypoints. We scout on it. I mean, it's just like in our hands, 24-hour use when we're out on the hunts. If you're uh, in a state that allows it, Stealth Cam, you can use code HUSH. You can save 30% on any Stealth Cam products. And then uh, you can also use code HUSH for our friends at Mountain Ops. Different kinds of supplements. We've got our own signature series line and you can save at checkout. So those are just a couple ways to help us out. We appreciate all the love, the support. We hope you have an amazing fall. We'll be doing more podcasts now that we're kind of going to be back in service for a few weeks before we jump on to the next one. A few weeks? Well, days. 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 Let's be honest. <laughs> I misspoke. Days. <laughs> uh, closing remarks, Case? Uh, yeah, yeah, I just want to go back to what I told you guys after this hunt. You know, um, if it's our, my tag or your tag or Brian's tag, whoever's tag, like we're all just wanting to see success. And when we come together, like we always do, it's just so much sweeter uh, when, we, when we have to go through the ups and downs. You know, we always say elk hunt roller coasters, ups and downs. <laughs> I felt like this morning I was like, man, when do we hit those ups? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. The roller coaster started low and she, fin she finished high. I can't wait for you guys to see the season. Um you know, if you guys have some feedback when, when we start launching it, uh, let us know. Because, we, we, like Logan said, we're trying to create the best content for you guys. And uh, if you like how we do it, let us know. If not, let us know. But I, I'm excited about what we decided to do this year. And I think you guys are going to absolutely love it. And who knows what happens the rest of the season. But, man, the first three have been all time. Matt Ice. Uh, persistence kills. And any, uh, anything, just be persistent. Love it. Logie Bear. Love all you guys. Love being in the woods with you guys and love it. Love it when we work as a team and things come together. Everybody out there listening, super stoked for 2022, how we're going to um, unfold things. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for all your support. We never say it enough, but we love you guys. You are the reason that we are able to do the things that we do, and have the moments like we did today. Indeed, indeed. You only get so many opening days, guys. Get out there, enjoy the woods, and uh, wishing you all the luck this fall. Appreciate you watching. See you next time. Thanks, guys. See you next time.